welcome everybody. Thank you to Mark for hosting this session and also thank you to everybody who organized this event, Apex at Home. And finally, thanks to all of you for attending. This is learning JavaScript concepts from real world solutions. This talk is somewhat loosely based on the Oracle Database Concepts Guide, which is just part of the standard documentation for Oracle Database. I hope everybody here is already aware of this documentation, the Database Concepts Guide. If you're not, uh, this is a must read for everybody here just to learn more about how Oracle Database works. And also, if you're having difficulty sleeping during these difficult times we're living in, uh, another great use for this Database Concepts Guide. As you can see, it's broken up into several categories. And I wanted to do something similar in terms of the categories. But I also wanted to bring in some sort of real world use cases in which we could learn these concepts. So the first of these is, of course, going to be JavaScript, the actual language. I think it's good to, to really ground yourself there. Also, the web APIs, such as the DOM and AJAX, there are many of these. A lot of the times they're confused for being part of the core language, but they're actually separate. And then, of course, frameworks and libraries. So we're thinking about things like jQuery, Jet, even the JavaScript API for Apex itself. Uh, we, we need to learn some of the concepts there. And then finally, and something that's going to help us with all of these different levels, is the browser developer tools that are baked in and available in all the browsers at this point. Very important concepts there as well. So let's get started. We're going to start with the first thing. This came from Scott Wesley. This was a tweet that he did in September of last year. He said, change floating label dynamically. And then he gave us a little one liner of code here. You can see what that looks like there. And you can see how it works here. So basically, you can see I'm focusing in an input. I'm typing in the input. And then the actual label for the input is changing. And the use case is potentially you have a form. Perhaps the selection of a value in the form can kind of change the meaning of another input somewhere else in the form. So you want to update the label to reflect that fact. That's kind of the idea here. And Scott actually had a blog post on this topic that went along with the tweet. And in the blog post, he actually gave us two different lines of code. And they actually do the same thing at the end of the day. The first thing, starting from the left and reading to the right, we see this dollar sign. And it's important to know that jQuery is uh, just the dollar sign. When you add jQuery to a web page, you get a shorthand reference. You could use either one, dollar sign or jQuery. It's the same thing at the end of the day. And jQuery is a DOM manipulation library. But to really sort of understand what that means, you're going to have to know a little something about the DOM. When I first started learning this stuff, the DOM is really intimidating. It turns out it's not all that bad. So of course, everyone here probably knows a little something about HTML. This is the language that the browser understands. It's going to read a document and then render it on the web page. And in the early days of the web, that was truly all there was. You had a static HTML file that was sent across the network, and then the browser just rendered what was in the file. But browser manufacturers knew that they wanted to do things more dynamically. They wanted to give developers the ability to change the contents, what's displayed on the screen, using code. But in order to do that, they needed a standard. And the DOM is that standard. You can think of it as two parts. One, it's the in-memory representation of the underlying HTML document. And since the HTML document is hierarchical in nature, this in-memory structure will also be hierarchical in nature. And that's why it's sometimes referred to as the DOM tree. And then, of course, there's going to be an API for working with and manipulating that memory structure. And as you make changes, those changes are going to be reflected in the web page instantly, live. So here's a quick example. Here we have an HTML document. You can see it's really simple. We start with HTML. And beneath that, we have body. You could say that body is the child of HTML. And HTML is the parent of body. Within body, we have a paragraph tag that has some text. And then we have a div that has an image. Now, when the browser goes to parse this, it's going to create an in-memory structure that looks like this. And it very much reflects that HTML structure we saw before. But rather than HTML tags, we now have DOM elements and nodes, as you see here. And these nodes actually have methods that allow you to change their contents or manipulate their properties 
as needed or as per the requirements you may have. It's worth noting that in the early days of the DOM, the APIs were not so great. They were super tedious to use, just a lot of lines of code, even to do simple things. And to make matters worse, browser manufacturers did things a little bit differently. So you would see code back in the early days that said, said something along the lines of, if you're working in Internet Explorer, execute this code path. For every other browser, execute some other code path. And it was a really awkward way to work. Nobody really enjoyed it. And then jQuery came in and solved the problem. It was introduced in 2006. It's just a, a DOM manipulation library. So what it did is first, it made all the API issues go away. It introduced very simple, easy to use APIs, even to do complex tasks. And perhaps more importantly, it worked across all browsers consistently. In fact, it was even patching several of the bugs that appeared in various browsers on the fly. I will say that today, these DOM APIs are getting better. There's a website listed here. You might not need jQuery.com. You can go there, just punch in the name of a method you're using in jQuery, and it will give you the native DOM APIs that you can use as an alternative. So some folks are going without jQuery at all, at all these days, but I do think it's still worth learning. I do believe it's still easier to use than native DOM APIs. And also, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. It's going to be in Apex for a while. So I still think it's worth learning rather than jumping right into the native DOM APIs. So that's what jQuery is, just a DOM manipulation library. And it's also a function. So when you add jQuery to your web page, you're adding a function. And just like we do in PL SQL, the way that we invoke a function in JavaScript is using parentheses. So that's what we see here. We're invoking the jQuery function, and we're passing it a string. And this string is something special. It's what's known as a selector in jQuery. And we have two different selectors in this case, but we have to know at least the basics of selectors to start using jQuery. So I have those listed here. The first one everyone needs to learn is hashtag ID. So you want to select by ID, you put a hashtag in front of the name of the ID you want. In the example here on the right, I'm selecting the element in the web page that has an ID of message. And you can think of an ID in a web page, something like a primary key and a table. There should be only one element in the web page that has this given ID. The next one down is selecting by class. So we just swap out the hashtag with the period and put the class name after that. And in the example on the right, I'm selecting all of the elements in the web page that have a class of boring. Now, unlike the ID, you can have an element that has many classes and you can have many elements that have the same class. So it's a little bit more flexible. Beneath that, you see how to select an element by its tag or element name, you just put in the tag name. So in this case here on the right, I'm selecting all of the unordered lists in the web page. And finally, at the bottom, I'm just pointing out that you can combine these selectors as a comma-separated comma list of values. So here I'm selecting all of the elements for the class of fun, as well as the element that has an ID of message. So here, what I've done is created a really basic web page to help you kind of get the idea of how this selection works. And as you can see, it's a basic list of emotions that Paul Ekman identified, a, a psychologist back in, I believe, the 60s, as sort of basic human emotions. As he traveled the world, he found that these were emotions humans didn't need to learn. We just sort of displayed them uh, implicitly across the world. Here is the HTML I used to build that web page. You can see this H1 at the top. This is displaying the message, how are you feeling? And then, of course, we have our emotions list happy, sad, fearful, disgusted, angry, and surprised. I've assigned a class to these elements to sort of tell us, you know, are they positive or negative emotions? Interestingly enough, the majority of the emotions that all of us humans display uh, without having to learn them are all negative. Only happy was positive, and then neutral was one kind of in the middle. It's, uh, you know, it depends on the surprise, if you will. So uh, beneath that list, you'll see the, the two inputs at the bottom, the uh, text field as well as the button to submit the form. So if we start with selecting by ID, I'm, I can put the hashtag and then question if I want to select that H1 that has the ID of question, simple enough. And here I'm just changing the name of the ID to select the unordered list that has an ID of emotions list. If I want to select by class, I just put in the dot and then the class name. In this case, if I select elements with a class of positive, I'll just get one element selected. But if I switch that to negative, I'm going to get four different elements. 
And of course, we can select by the element name as well. If I just put in the div, I'm going to get all the divs in the page. Or I can put input and get the input you see at the bottom. So that's what we're passing. We're passing in a selector so that we can select various elements in the web page. Now, the selector at the top you may still look a little uh, difficult to read. Don't worry, that's a more advanced selector. We're going to get to that later. Now, after you, or I should say rather, how did uh, Scott know how to use that particular selector? It comes down to your browser's developer tools. So basically what you do, you go and right click the element in the page and inspect it. And once you've done that, it'll open the developer tools on the elements tab. You can identify your input and then traverse up from there and eventually locate your label. And you'll notice on the label, there's some properties here such as for an ID, and that's what you're going to be targeting. All right, so that covers the selector. Going back now to the function, when we invoke a jQuery function, we pass in the selector, what jQuery is going to return is a jQuery object. And you can think of that as a wrapper around the underlying DOM nodes that were selected. And this is the, the, the wrapper is what's going to provide the easy to use APIs that I mentioned earlier. So here we're using one called text to change the labels text. Of course, that's not the only one you have available to you. We'll uh, look at a few here. So this is just simple DOM manipulation. Starting at the top, we have the ability to add and remove classes. So really popular, you might use add class and remove class. In the example on the right, I'm selecting a list item with the class of done, and I'm saying remove the class done and then add the class pending. So we're sort of swapping out some classes there. Here we have modify attributes. There's a number of methods you can use to do this, and the adder is very popular. So here I'm saying select the inputs on the page and set the attribute name disabled equal to disabled. And that may look a little weird at first, but that's kind of a Boolean in HTML. Of course, you can add new content to the DOM. There are a number of methods for that. I'm just demonstrating prepend here. So I'm selecting the unordered lists on the page, and then I'm appending a list item to the bottom that says hello. And I could have used prepend instead to put the list item at the top rather than the bottom of the unordered list. If you can add content, of course, you can remove it. Here we have remove and empty. So here I'm selecting the unordered list, and I'm saying empty, which will remove all of the children elements from this node. Or I could have used remove, which also would have removed the unordered lists themselves. And then finally, at the bottom, we see that we can manipulate CSS properties in addition to classes by the CSS or using the CSS method. So here I'm selecting the H1s on the page and setting the CSS property color equal to red. So those are the basics there. Here are a few examples. So I'm starting with the list item that has a class of neutral in the page. And then I can use add class and pass in positive. And you'll see now that this has two different classes. And I can follow that up with remove class. And now we're down to a single class. I've essentially made surprised positive. In the next example, again, the, the selector is a little more complex. I'll, I'll cover that in just a little bit. But I'm selecting the input at the bottom that has uh, this type equal to text. And then I can invoke adder to set the disabled property equal to disabled. And you see that down here. Once I've done that, no user would be able to interact with this item because, of course, it would be disabled. In this case, I'm starting with the emotions list, unordered list on the page. And then I'm using append to add another list item at the bottom. I believe amusement is something Paul Ekman added uh, when he revised his list uh, a few years after the initial one. And in this last example, I'm starting with question. And you see the text, how are you feeling? If you can change that on the server side, that's the best. But if for whatever reason you can't and you want it to say something different, no problem. Invoke text, pass the new text you'd like it to display, and then all of a sudden you'll see the new message. So going back to what we saw before, Text is just a simple method that allows you to update uh, the text. And in this case, we're updating the, the labels text. This is what Scott was doing. So in this one line of code, we've actually touched already on several of the categories of concepts that I wanted to talk to you about today. The first being web APIs. We've talked a little about the DOM and what the DOM tree is. We've talked about under frameworks and libraries, we've covered jQuery, basic selectors, and manipulation. And as far as browser developer tools go, we've talked about the elements tab.
Let's look at the next example. So this one came from Anton Nielsen and Jorge Rimblas, and they were basically working with a customer who was going into an interactive report, filtering the data down until they had one row, and then they would click the edit button and go to the, the form for that particular row. And the question was, is there any way we can make it or automate it such that when there is a single row in the interactive report, we automatically navigate to the form page, save ourselves a click, if you will. And the solution looks a little like this. If I filter on Depno, we still see the rows, I'm not navigating, but if I add another filter that gets us to one row, now we automatically navigate. If I cancel and I go back, it does not automatically navigate, and that's important as well. These are the lines of code that they came up with, and it's important to point out that these lines of code were meant for a dynamic action. Of course, to understand what that means, you have to know some concepts about dynamic actions. And the way I like to think about it, there are four different ways that you can add JavaScript to an Apex application. You can use dynamic actions, dynamic actions with JavaScript hooks, page and component level attributes, and then static files. I think of these as a progression. So what are dynamic actions? Basically a declarative way for you to add dynamic behaviors to your pages in Apex. So just like many things in Apex, you'll just use declarative screens and options to define what you would like to have happen and when, and then Apex will automatically generate the JavaScript code for you, add it to the page and execute it at the right time without you having to do anything. You can think of these as two parts as well. So we have the dynamic action, think of that as the parent. This is where you're gonna define the event and a related component. So it may be the click on a button or perhaps the change of the value of an item in a form. And the actions, you can think of those as the children, these are gonna be the responses uh, to the dynamic action that's defined in the parent. Maybe you're hiding or showing elements. There are a variety of actions that you can choose from. And this example, perhaps uh, you get different requirements like this. So this one says, disable the alternate phone number field until phone number is populated. So you see phone number down here. And the idea is, unless this has a value, we want to disable the alternate number field. I often ask myself these questions when going to solve these before I start creating the dynamic action. The first question is, what is the driver? Well, the driver could be phone number, or maybe alternate phone field, but it's the value of phone number that is affecting what is happening elsewhere on the page. So phone number is the driver, and perhaps more explicitly, it's the change of the value of phone number that is driving what's going to happen elsewhere on the page. So that's important. Is there a condition? Now, when we say condition, here talking about dynamic actions, we're talking about a client-side condition, not a server-side condition. And the client-side condition in dynamic actions can create a fork in the logic such that you have actions that execute when the condition is true and actions that execute when the condition is false. In this case, we would have a condition and it you could do it either way. Either phone number is null or phone number is not null. That would just swap your true and false actions. Um, but those actions would be, we're going to disable phone number uh, or rather alternate number and then enable it at the right time. And finally, is page load relevant? You'll find that in addition to the event that we're kind of building the action on, in this case, the change event, we also have a very important event for all actions, which is the page load event. And you may need to run the action at that time too. And is it relevant here? Yes, because when the page loads, even if we don't change a value, we may need to disable or enable the phone field according to the value of the phone number field. So it ends up looking like this. We have in the parent section, and when we're defining our dynamic action in the when, we say when the phone number changes for the condition, the value is null, then we disable the alternate phone field, and we make sure to enable the page load setting. And we do the same uh, in the false side. We just enable and, and make sure we have that uh, setting enabled there as well. Dynamic actions with JavaScript hooks are sort of the next place people go. So you, once you learn the basics of dynamic actions and you've explored all the declarative parts fairly well, then you can start to leverage some parts that you would only be able to leverage if you know a little bit of JavaScript code. The creators of the framework knew that you couldn't do everything out of the box using declarative menus. There's just too many things to account for. So rather than even attempt that, they added little hooks for folks that know some JavaScript 
that allow the framework to be much more flexible and powerful than it would otherwise have been. And I think personally, this is going to be a sweet spot for most Apex developers. Once you learn how to use these JavaScript hooks, you'll probably be able to do most of the requirements that you're handed. So here's where you're going to find them. We're starting, remember, we have this parent child. We're in the parent area, and we're looking at the when portion. And there's actually two places here where we have some hooks. So generally, when you're defining the event, like click or change or any other event that's there, uh, you can just select it. But as I mentioned, you're only going to have a subset of all of the possible events that could occur on an element. So if your event is not in the list, no worries. Just select custom and then type the name of the event where it says custom event. You can, in fact, do a space delimited list of event names here to listen to more than one event at the same time. Below that, you'll see selection type. This is usually where you're going to select something declaratively, such as in region, an item, or a button. But what if you didn't want to work with a region, item, or a button? Well, you have a jQuery selector option here. And we've already talked about jQuery selectors. So as long as you know how to write one, you can just put that in here instead. Moving to the next one, but staying at the parent level, we've just gone down now to the client side condition. Most of the, actually almost all except one of the client side conditions are built to work with the value of a single item. But what if you have a requirement where you got to check the value of two items, or maybe you're not even working with the value of items at all? Well, for that, you can just select JavaScript expression, and then you can type in code as long as it's an expression that resolves to true or false. And you can check the help for additional options that you'll have available to you there. Finally, now we've moved down to the child area, the actions. There are lots of great actions that you can start with. Hide, show, enable, disable, even refresh, which is declarative AJAX. However, you're not going to find everything you might need to do given certain requirements. And so there's a catch-all here. Execute JavaScript code. Provided you know how to write some JavaScript code, you can just punch it in right here, and it'll do what you need to get done. So going back to the solution, the two-liner, these lines of code were meant for dynamic action. The first one is our client-side condition, and the second one is meant to be in an action, execute JavaScript. So let's look at the condition first. Now, this part should look familiar. We've already seen this. We know that the dollar sign is jQuery. We know that jQuery is a function and that we're invoking that function, and we're passing it, of course, a selector. But as I said before, this is one of those advanced selectors we haven't talked about yet. So let's get into some of the more advanced selectors. We'll start here with hierarchical selectors. So the first one we'll see is how to select child element. So let's start first at the top here. I'm going to start by selecting the element that has a class of question wrapper. And then what I'm going to do is add greater than and then div. And so what I'm saying here is start with what's on the left and then go one, exactly one level down, and select what's on the right. And you'll notice that under this div, we actually do have some other input elements, but we're not selecting those because they don't match the selector on the right-hand side. So that's one level down. That's a child selector. What if you wanted to go many levels down? Descendant selector is what you want. All you have to do is omit the greater than sign, and you'll go down many levels. In this case, we started with the div at the very top, and we got the div below it, but also the div below that one. So this is a uh, these are both examples of hierarchical selectors. We'll take a look at a few other kind of random ones, starting here with form. So jQuery has the concept of pseudo selectors. You put the colon here in front of button, and it selects buttons in the page. Well, I don't have any button elements here, but actually I do. This input has a type of button, so it will render as a button, so jQuery knows to select that. Here's a content selector. I'm saying select the elements that have text that contains the word R. And you can see that appears here in two different places. And so, of course, we get those elements. But because of the hierarchical nature of HTML, we also get their parent elements. Because you could say that even the top level div contains this, this text. And it actually goes up even to elements that aren't on the page, like body and HTML. Now, finally, we get to the attribute selector. So elements in HTML have attributes. And the way an attribute selector works is with the square brackets. So in between the square brackets here, I'm saying type. And what that means is select the elements on the page that have an attribute named type. Doesn't matter the value. So we get both inputs here at the bottom. If I want to be more specific, I can add on to that. And I can say where type is equal to the value text here. So now I'm only getting the one input that has the type equal to text. 
I could be even more specific. And this is true with selecting by ID or selecting by class. I can put a tag name in front. So here I'm saying, just give me the inputs in the page that have a type attribute with a value equal to text. Uh, very expressive uh, language these, these selectors are. But at the end of the day, I'm still selecting the same input. So going back to the condition, this should hopefully be a little bit easier to read now. What we're doing is selecting table data elements that have a headers attribute with a value equal to link. And the question, of course, should pop up. Uh, how did they know to use that selector? It's, again, using the elements tab of your developer tools. So the first thing they did is they went in, and this is the header row of an interactive report. This is the link column that would take you to the form. And when you inspect that, what you'll see is that there's this ID attribute here. It has a value of link. But beneath that, you'll see that the other table headers have IDs that are randomly assigned. But you can assign static IDs for columns if you need them. But this one defaults to link. Okay. And if you then go down, we move from the header down to the actual content in the body, what you'll see is that we have table data elements. And again, we're seeing the uh, headers equal to, to link here. This is sort of a, a way of connecting what's in the body of the table with what's in the headers. Okay, So we have this. And in fact, you would find that same uh, attribute, headers equals link, in all of the rows for this column. So that's how they knew to target that. Again, the object returned from the jQuery function is going to be a jQuery object, and it has a property named length. And length will give you a count of the number of elements that your selector selected. And so the condition, at the end of the day, when they're comparing length to a value, they're looking for that one row. Remember the requirement. If there's one row in the interactive report, take us to the form. So that's the condition in a nutshell. And it kind of looks like this. You have after refresh of the uh, employees region, and then here's our condition. You just put that in there. So moving on now to the execute JavaScript action, and again, starting from left to right, uh, the first things that kind of pop out here are Apex and navigation. These are namespaces in, in the Apex JavaScript APIs. So of course, to, to really understand what's going on there, you have to know a little bit about the Apex JavaScript APIs. So Apex does ship with a number of APIs uh, that, are, that are specific for JavaScript, and, and they know about the Apex architecture and how the components work. A library like jQuery and, frankly, even Jet, they know nothing about Apex. These are lower-level libraries, but the Apex APIs are, are very much aware of how Apex works. And these have been evolving over time, so make sure that uh, you keep up on what's being added and what's being deprecated, and you can do that. Uh, by using this link here at the bottom, apex.oracle.com slash JSAPI. That'll take you to the most up-to-date uh, doc on these APIs. And also check your release notes as well to know what's being deprecated. Uh, the way I like to envision this is you kind of have, at the very lowest level, you have native JavaScript code and the web APIs. And then on top of that, you have things like jQuery, jQuery UI, and Jet. And jQuery is obviously going to use the lower level, jQuery UI may use some jQuery, it may use the lower level. Jet used to use jQuery and jQuery UI less and less these days. It's using more of the lower levels. But then the Apex APIs are on top of that. They could use any of the things below it. And your code's going to be on top of that. And you have access to, to even the Apex APIs. So use these when possible and go to the lower levels only when needed. Now, when these APIs were first starting to be introduced, they were just functions that were being introduced into what we call the global scope, if you will. You can think of that a bit like the sys schema in Oracle. And the problem with adding more and more functions to the uh, global scope or the sys schema is that you introduce more and more opportunity for a naming collision, right? If the Apex team has a function that's uh, named something really common and then you write one, you might overwrite theirs. That could break the app, be hard to debug, that kind of stuff. So. Um, they moved away from that, but there are still some remnants of this. And I think still very commonly used are these three functions that exist still in the global scope. In the scope. We have dollar sign $x, dollar sign $b, and dollar sign $s. And so I'll show you what these are. Dollar sign $x is really just a shortcut reference to document.getElementById. So document.getElementById is a native DOM API. 
rather than having to type all that out, you can just say dollar sign X and pass in the name of the element you're after, or the ID rather. Below that, you're seeing dollar sign V. This is used to get the value of an item in Apex, and this is one of those ones that what I meant earlier by it understands the architecture of Apex. So if I check just the first two options here, and I invoke dollar sign V, it's going to give me one colon two because it knows how a list of values works in Apex. And likewise, if I use dollar sign S, which is used to set the value of a checkbox, if I passed in all three separated by colons one, two, and three, then all of these options would be checked afterward. So eventually, the team moved to using namespaces. And the idea here is that you have to still expose something and the global scope, so that's the root namespace. That's going to be Apex. And a namespace, the way to think of it maybe, an analogy might be like packages in PL SQL, just a way to organize your code. And all of these are going to contain different numbers of properties, events, functions, and even other namespaces. So the one that we start with is the root or Apex uh, namespace. And you can see some of the properties here that you'll find in the doc, including functions like confirm and submit which are commonly used. And then if you go down to Apex Navigation in the doc, you'll see the functions it has, including this one called Redirect, which is pretty cool. You just invoke Redirect, you pass it a URL, and it takes you to that page in the current window. But it also does some things like substitution syntax that you can utilize for some additional flexibility rather than hard coding that yourselves. So that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing Apex and Navigation. These are just namespaces. And then we see we're using that redirect uh, function to take the user to the page, uh, the form page. Now, the URL itself is going to come from this code here. And we can actually read this code now, right? Everybody's comfortable with this? So what we're doing is selecting the table data elements that have a header, uh, headers attribute with a value of link. This is actually a descendant selector. So we're going one level down from here to the anchor underneath that. And then I'm using the adder method. In this case, I'm not passing two parameters, but just one. So it's acting as a getter rather than a setter. It's going to return that href attribute value. So of course, the question should be, how did they know to use that selector and that attribute? And the answer, again, is just going into your developer tools. So they're imagining that there's one row in the report, and they drill in on this element here, and they see, OK, it's under the table data element. That's where they're starting. So they're using the attribute selector. They could have used descendant or child. It's the same in this case. And then you see the href attribute here had the URL that the user needed to go to. So that's where, why they targeted that attribute. All right, so here we've added advanced selectors, dynamic actions, including client-side uh, conditions and execute JavaScript action. And we've also talked about the uh, Apex JavaScript API Apex navigation specifically. All right, so the next one here is, uh, I think, a pretty common requirement where you can imagine a master detail scenario. So interactive grid on the top, you select a row. The user wanted to say, you know, if you're looking at departments on the top, they wanted the, the detail region to display the fact that you're looking at that particular master row. Pretty easy. Um, here's, the, here's what it looks like. So we select accounting down below. It says employees in accounting. Select research. It displays research. So this is actually one that I tackled on Stack Overflow. And this is the code that I ended up coming up with. So as you can see, maybe not too bad, just a few lines of code. Again, meant to be executed as part of a dynamic action. It's going to be one of these execute JavaScript actions. And you can see what it looks like here. So this is the when portion. When the selection changes, and this is specific to interactive reports, and that's in the departments region, the parent region, then, and this is the action portion, I'm going to execute this code here. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm using variables to break down the code. That wasn't necessary. I could have just said, you know, taken this code here on the right-hand side of the assignment, operator. And I could have put that in where you see selected record on the second line. And then I could have taken that entire bit of code and put that where you see selected department on the third line and just kind of collapse this all to a single line. But that would be very hard to both write and maintain. So that's not a great idea. Instead, we need 
to know how to declare variables in JavaScript to break this down into logical steps. So here I'm using the var keyword to declare variables, and this first one is selected record. And the next thing I'm doing is a referencing this dot data to get at something. And you may be asking, wait a second, how did he know? How did I know how to use this dot data? Well, going back to where you saw, saw me put in the code for the execute JavaScript action, if you look at the help, you'll see that there's a lot of very useful information here. And they're telling us that this keyword is gonna give you a number of different properties you can use or not, depending on your requirements. And this dot data down below, it just says optional additional data that can be passed from the event handler. So what I did, I went in, I created the action, and then I looked at the console tab in my browser tools. And when I clicked the row, the dynamic action framework just was logging this out there. So I was able to go and open that up and see everything that they had documented, including this data property. When you open that, you see, ah, selected records. And if you open that, ooh, sales is what I want to display in the detail region. And I also noticed this model thing as well. Now that selected records here, the selected records is kind of uh, complex in that it's an array of arrays. So what I'm doing here is I'm just getting the first element in the array. So selected record is itself an array and you saw those values. And I think it was the third value that I was after for the department name. But it was weird that it was the third value in the array and I was worried what if another developer changes the order of the columns? Will that change the order that I get here? And it was too risky to just leave it alone. So I decided to search the documentation to get at the um, model, see what, see what was going on with that and why they were passing it to us. So what I did, I went to the JavaScript documentation and I scrolled through it until I saw something that looked like it fit. That's under interfaces and you'll eventually see model. When you go there, you'll see a number of methods that you have available. So I just kind of scrolled through these until I saw something that looked promising, which was get value. And when you go into that, it, sees, it shows you you can pass in a record and the field name you're after, and it will then return the value. So you don't have to worry about the order of the columns in the array. So that's what I did. I just said, here's the selected record. Give me the department name. So now this will have the department name. And then I just used that to update the DOM using the methods we've already learned in jQuery. So I get my new text and then I use the text method to assign that to the uh, region title in this case. And you can see on the left, I'm using another hierarchical selector. I'm starting with the region. This is the child region that has this ID. So I assigned a static ID. And then I said, you know what, go into that region title here. And I targeted that by its class and then just update the text as needed. So with this one, we've covered declaring variables in JavaScript. We talked about the model interface and also the console tab in your browser's developer tools. Moving on to the last one here. This one we definitely see a lot. The idea is quite simple. You have a report, could be classic or interactive, and you want to add a column that says delete. They click it and it deletes the row. Here's what it looks like. So you got this column. They click it. They're prompted. Are you sure? They say yes. Row's gone. Pretty simple, right? So how can we put something like this together? Well, for this one, I thought I would do a little bit of live demo. And here we are in Apex. Hopefully I'm still logged in. Woohoo! Okay. So I'm gonna go into this app called JavaScript Concepts, and I'm gonna create a page. This will be a report. I'm gonna do a classic report, and I'll do this, we'll call it uh, employees. And for the table, I'm gonna use emp. We create that, and if I run it, you can see our classic report. And what I need is a column over here. So to do that, uh, what I'm gonna do is go back to the region. So here are the columns, and you, you can see the standard columns for the M table. I'm gonna right click on columns, and I'm gonna say create virtual column. And it defaults to link, but I'm gonna switch that to plain text so that I get access to this column, column formatting here in this HTML expression. Now, if you don't know, and I don't know the code to write a, a good looking button, 
no problem. Just go to apex.oracle.com slash UT for universal theme. And this will take you to an application that is available in your package tabs, but it's just easier to get to here. Go to the section here, reference, and you'll see something called button builder. If you drill down in the button builder, it's exactly what it says it is. It's a button builder. So you see what a button looks like, and here's the code that you need to do it. But the neat thing is that you can customize it. So I'm going to say, I want it to say delete. And you know what? I want an icon. And I want my icon to look like a delete icon. So I'll use this trash can. We keep going. It's going to be in a report row. So I want to make it tiny. And yeah, it's pretty dangerous. So we're going to make it nice and red there. That looks pretty good. Here's all the code needed. I'm just going to copy this, go back, drop it in the HTML expression. And when I run this, now we have our column. Of course, it doesn't do anything, right? So the next step is to create the dynamic action that's going to respond to the click on these buttons. So what I'll do is go back, dynamic actions, we'll create a new one. We'll call this one delete clicked. And I'm going to say it's the click event on the button. Ooh, we have a problem. There are no buttons on this page, at least according to Apex. That's why we have the jQuery selector. So what kind of selector could I write to select all of those buttons? Well, if you look at the code in the region that I used for the column, you'll notice that this does have a number of classes that I could use to target, but all of them are kind of, I don't know, generic. And I wouldn't want to target something accidentally. So I'm going to add another class more specific to our use case, delete emp. So I'll hit OK. And what that means, I can come over to the action here and say the class, so period, and then delete emp. So that's the first part. Now what I want to do, uh, the action, I want to delete a row. So maybe we'll go with execute PL SQL. And we're going to say delete from emp, where emp no equals, ooh. Yeah, they're in a row. They're clicking on something. I need. We're going to need bind variable syntax, so we typically use items for this. Now, I'm going to uh, create this item. It doesn't exist yet, but we'll say p14 empno. And of course, this will be an item that's in the DOM. So prior to executing this PL SQL code, I need Apex to submit the value from the DOM into session state prior to running this code. So that looks good. We'll go ahead and go back to the region and create this item. And this will be a hidden item. And it's protected by default, which is good. But this is one of those cases where I actually do want to change the value explicitly. So I'm going to turn off that protection. We'll save the page. We'll run it. And now I'm going to hit delete. And I just deleted Smith. I refreshed the page. It didn't work. So how do we solve this? The developer tools. This time, we're going to take a look at the network tab. So you'll see that when I click delete, it, it adds a new row down here in terms of the network request response that we're getting with the browser. If I hit the next one, we get another one. And what you can do here, you can click on one of these to actually see the HTTP traffic going to and from the client and the server. You can see all the response headers, all of the request headers. And at the very bottom, you'll see form data. And you'll see in here that I'm submitting page items to submit. Here's P14 EMPNO. The value is null. Uh, I forgot. I need to take the value that's in the same row as the button that was clicked. I need to get over to this column, the EMPNO. And then I need to set, I need to transfer the value of this number to the hidden item prior to executing the PL SQL code. All right? So to do that, I'm going to add another action. This one will be execute JavaScript code, but I need it to happen before the PL SQL code. And the code itself, just a two liner, but I did, oops, I did want to have this ready to go. Don't know why. Hmm, this is strange. 
Well, I don't know why I'm not able to get to it. Let me just try this real quick. Okay, I'll move this back. Beautiful. Okay. So we're going, I'm going to paste this in here and then we're going to talk about this code. So the first thing I'm doing is declaring a variable named empno. And I'm using a jQuery selector and I'm selecting this dot triggering element. Remember, you'll find that in the help. And this triggering element represents the button that was clicked. And then I'm using the closest method, which is one of these uh, traversal methods that goes up the DOM tree. So if you think about this button, if I inspect the button, we see here's the button and I'm telling it to go up the DOM tree and stop at the first table row. So it's going to go up to this parent. It's not going to stop there because that's not a table row. Then it's going to get to this one and it's going to stop there. And we have the whole table row now beneath us. So the next part is find and find is similar to closest, but it goes down the DOM tree and I'm telling it find table data elements with the headers equal to empno. So we go from the table row down to here and this matches that. So I see this value here and I access that value with the text method and I put it into empno. And then I'm going to map using dollar sign s, which we talked about already. I'm going to map the value from empno to this item here. So we hit OK, we save and run. And now when I hit delete on Smith, if I go to the network tab and look at that back and forth, we'll see now empno is getting this value. And if I refresh the page, Smith is gone. So that's good, but just two more steps to kind of bring this all home. First, I want to confirm that the user wants to do this because that's kind of a, a, a big deal, deleting an employee. So we'll say, are you sure? And then finally, we shouldn't have to refresh the page. We have declarative Ajax at our disposal. So I'm just going to go ahead and turn that on. Now when we run the page, if I want to delete Alan, I hit delete, I confirm and Alan's gone. All right. So this slide here is really just for folks in the future if you're just going through the slides to kind of know about some of the things I just did. But what we've now sort of rounded out the picture with are some more concepts in the web APIs. We talked about Ajax. That also applies to dynamic actions. Both um, You can use both uh, declarative and uh, code-based Ajax there. And then finally, we talked about the network tab in your browser developer tools. Now, if you'd like to learn more, you can just head to youtube.com slash C slash Oracle Apex. That's the homepage for Oracle Apex uh, in the YouTube space. And if you scroll down, eventually you'll get to a section titled Intro to JavaScript for Apex Developers. This is a course I released a little over a month ago for folks that are coming into this space and want to learn. JavaScript based on some of the things you may already know in PL SQL or Oracle database. So kick the tires there. I'll kind of uh, cover some additional topics like round out the skills in JavaScript, some of the things you see here. And of course, I will uh, cover some of the things that I covered in this class, but rather than a top down approach, it'll be more the formal bottom up approach. All right, that's all I have for you. I hope you found this useful. And if you've not already started your journey into JavaScript. Hopefully this was enough to motivate you to do so. I guess we'll open it up now to questions. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. That was great. Uh, so we did get a few questions in uh, via chat. Uh, I think the first one is a general question, like where can we get the slides? Uh, we will make all the rec recordings available uh, soon. Uh, so all the sessions that we're having uh, today uh, will be available on the uh, Apex, uh, our uh, office hours uh, page. All right, right, so maybe then. what I can do then is I'll go into the video and, and make sure that the link to the slides is in the uh, description for the uh, video. Sure, yeah, that'd be great. All right, uh, then a few JavaScript specific questions. Should I write ES5 or ES6 JavaScript syntax for Apex? I suppose that depends on the browsers that you need to support. If you're working uh, in certain organizations that are still using, let's say, Internet Explorer, maybe Internet Explorer 6 and so, so on, uh, you kind of you have to use what you have to use. But if you're in uh, a more modern shop that's using evergreen browsers, then feel free to use the latest and greatest stuff. There's certainly no reason not to. 
All right, uh, and then uh, one that I don't quite understand. Uh, when can we consider static or dynamic scope? I'm not sure I understood. It's probably more in the context of something I covered earlier. Yeah. Static or dynamic scope? Hmm. Do you remember when that question was asked? Um, halfway through here, early on, uh, 320. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure where that one was going. I apologize. Oh, no worries. But uh, feel free to, 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 if you want to provide some context and, and get the answer to that question, feel free to chat me up either in Twitter or uh, email, uh, which can be found in social media up there. All right, cool. Uh, and then, yes, a good one. Uh, will Apex eventually remove jQuery library at all? Will be ever. So <laughs> I'm not on the Apex team. Uh, I've spoken with some of the folks on the team and the answer was that they are heavily using Apex, I'm sorry, jQuery themselves. So it is unlikely to go anywhere anytime soon. So I think uh, for the foreseeable future, you can feel confident using and learning with jQuery. Uh, and when, if and when the time comes that uh, jQuery will be removed, I believe you'll have ample time to then uh, switch over to native DOM APIs. Uh, makes sense to me. Uh, would you recommend moving away from V$, S$, and use Apex item namespace instead? Yeah, uh, so that's an interesting question. Um, I actually would. Uh, I think that we should all uh, move away from any of the legacy functions in the global scope and move toward uh, the properly namespaced functions. I admit, personally, that's a bit of a journey as well, uh, but there's there's subtle differences in in the way that they work. So like dollar sign v as opposed to get value from the from the uh, namespace method. So just be aware of that. Um, but that's where most of the development is going on now. So I think it's a good good thing to do overall. Yes. All right. Next one is there a mobile detection function in Apex JavaScript API? I don't believe so. Ooh, yeah, I was going to say, that's a good question. Maybe one for you, Mark. <laughs> I've not seen one. Yeah, no. Uh, Maybe there's an undocumented one. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't think we have that. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, sequence of the question a little bit funky here. So uh, can we pass page item values in alert or confirm instead of static text? That's an interesting question. I've never tried it personally. I, I think I would um, just check the help. So if we say alert, supported substitutions, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't support it, you use execute JavaScript and do the alert yourself. All right. All right, there's another one about interactive reports and interactive grids. Is it possible to create a computed column in interactive reports and interactive grids via JavaScript? Is it possible to create a computed column? I don't believe, hmm. I'm trying to remember if Apex supports the same uh, virtual column that uh, we see with, let me see if I have a, Here's an interactive report. I believe it works a little bit differently here. This is page three. I don't know why it's not going there. Yeah, so I can't just right click and, and do it there. Um, I think it's about uh, doing this through JavaScript rather than kind of using the computed columns that we built into all those components. Oh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, good question. I've never seen that, no. All right, uh, there's a lengthy one uh, about uh, menu icons. I'm just going to read it. Uh, uh, but. Uh, I'm injecting the menu icons DOM for topper menu template with JavaScript. It works great until eight enable overflow to true. I don't know if, I don't, I don't know if you see the, the Q and A there. It's like at 342. 
and then goes on with uh, the DOM dynam change dynamically and my changes will not be persisted. How can I subscribe a function to menu before final render to eject the icons? That is a very specific question. I think that's probably a good one for Stack Overflow. Yeah. I recommend maybe asking the question there where uh, a lot of people can get eyes on it. Just make sure you tag it with Apex and perhaps uh, the version that you're using. Make sure to include that information. And I'm sure we can, uh, we can help you there. And who knows, maybe uh, that question will end up in a future version of this talk. <laughs> well, thank you all again very much for attending. And thanks again, Mark, for hosting the session. And I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the day.